Most High Yahuwah be praised. Truly, I bless King of Glory today for his mercies and his kindness toward us. We thank the Almighty for another opportunity to spend time in prayer and to commune with the Creator through Yahshua, our King. The scriptures teach us that we are seated together with Him in the heavenly places. And I love that truth. While we live here in our physical bodies, yet in the spirit realm, the Bible says that we are seated with him in the heavenly places. So when we pray, when we commune with Elohim, when we worship, when we, through the spirit, by faith, connect with Elohim in the heavens. We are seated there with him. And it is wonderful to understand that truth. Bless the Almighty. Today, I want to share on the subject of born from above. This topic is uh, a very familiar topic to many who teach the scriptures. Uh, it's a very familiar topic to most within the framework of the Messianic community because it is foundational. It is the very uh, rock of our faith. It, it has to do with the beginning of our knowing Elohim and coming into the things of Elohim. But I was led to um, teach on this today to bring out some things that I believe would help us to understand what we have received in the Messiah a little bit more accurately. Now, I believe in being accurate when it comes to the knowledge of Elohim, the knowledge of the scriptures, when it comes to growing in faith, I believe it's very important to be accurate, at least to the best of our knowledge and ability, with reference to the biblical resources we have and the information that supports the scriptures through historical records and many other things. Because when you do not have an accurate understanding of what has been left to us in the written records. If that information is not transmitted accurately and properly, then a person can obtain the wrong message. They can obtain an improper concept, what we call misinformation. And so I want to um, look at this topic today, and I'm using the title Born from Above instead of Born Again. In our translation in the Bible, as we look at John chapter 3, much of what we're going to be talking about is synonymous with being born again. That's a phrase that believers all throughout the era of what we call Protestantism have talked about, being born again. Question. 
question is asked. Have you been born again? But we want to understand that really based upon what the scriptures say. At least from the Greek text about being born again. And what we discover is that instead of saying born again, literally the text says born from above. It's literally what the Greek word indicates. Have you been born from above? So I want to read from John chapter 3. I'm going to read the first 10 verses. I'm going to deal with the whole situation of Messiah and his response to this Pharisee. That came to him. All right, let's go to chapter 3 of Yochanan, that's John in Hebrew language. First verse, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees. So here we have a man who was of the Pharisees, the Perushim, that's the Hebrew term for the Pharisees. He was of the Pharisees, named Nicodemus. It says he was a ruler of of the Judeans or of the Jews. So this man was not any man. He was a high ranking man of stature and standing who was a part of the sect of the Pharisees but he was a ruler of the Jews. He was one of the elders. He was a part of the Sanhedrin, the highest council of the Israelite community in Judah. So he wasn't a nobody. He was somebody of great stature. He was somebody whom they would call a dignitary. He comes to Messiah. Check it out. Verse 2, it says, The same came to Yahshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. You are a more who's come from Elohim. For no man can do these miracles that you do except Elohim be with him. Yahshua answered and said to him, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, except or unless a man be born from above. Now I said that that phrase born again, literally, it should be born from above. It's important that we note that. The word there in the Greek, and I'm, and I'm going to read that word to us, it's amethyst. It's a Greek word, amethyst. And the term in the root of that term refers to something from above, something that's higher. So what Yahshua actually said to him, he didn't say to him, be born anew. He didn't say to him, be born again, even though that is implied. But what he said was, unless a person is born from above, that's what he's saying. So anytime there's an indication of something coming from above, it is with reference to that which is in the Hashemayim, the heavens. It's a phrase which means primarily, unless you are born from Elohim, you cannot enter. He says, check it out. He says, Except 
or unless a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of Elohim. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? So now Nicodemus is looking at the situation from a natural perspective. He's hearing Yahshua, but he's looking at it from a natural perspective. Because when we look at the whole idea of being born or brought forth, because the, the term birth, it means to be brought forth. And literally, everyone who is born into the world in the technical sense, is born from Elohim. Elohim is the one who has created the situation for an individual to be brought forth into the world. So in the technical sense, everyone is born from above. Our spirit comes from above. Our spirit is what animates the physical body. So Nicodemus is kind of looking at this thing naturally. That's why he asked the question. So let's continue. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So like I said, Nicodemus, he's looking at this thing naturally. In his mind, Hebraically, there was already an understanding. Since all souls belong to Elohim, all men that are born or are brought forth into the world come from Elohim or are born technically from above. So he's looking at this and he's asking, how can someone who is old go back into the womb of their mother and be brought forth again a second time? And so Yahshua answers, verily, verily, I say to you, except or unless a man be born of water and of the spirit or and spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of Elohim. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it lists or where it wants to. And you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell from where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered, and he said to him, How can these things be? Yahshua answered and said to him, are you a master or aren't you a master of Israel? He said, you're a teacher. You're a more of Israel. And you don't know these things? So now, in looking at these verses, Nicodemus is talking to Yahshua. It's evident that Nicodemus is not connecting with what Yahshua is saying. Yahshua says to Nicodemus, you need to be born from above. And so Nicodemus goes into his Pharisaic mind. He goes into his Pharisaic way of understanding the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. And in his conclusions, he's thinking, how do you go back through the cycle again and come back being born a second time? So how does that happen? 
when you owe. So Yahshua had to break it down to him. He, he had to help him to, to get it. Because in Nicodemus' mind at that moment, it was difficult for him to put that together. Now, for those who might not really understand why it was difficult for Nicodemus to get it, is because Nicodemus was an Israelite. He was a Pharisee. Nicodemus understood that as an Israelite, being born into the house of Israel, into the family of Israel, that he did not have to undergo any kind of processes that would indicate that he needed to have a spiritual rebirth. He didn't have to undergo anything that would indicate that. Because in his mind, he thought he was still in the covenant with Elohim, even though the covenant was broken. So when Yahshua tells Nicodemus, you need to be born from above. Yahshua had to break it down to him so that he would understand that this being born from above is not the natural way. It's not the way that Elohim designed it from the time of Adam. He said, but this thing that I'm talking about is a being brought forth by the Spirit. Ah, now Messiah is communicating something that's a little different to the ears of Nicodemus. So what he says to Nicodemus in introducing the idea of, of, of being born of the Spirit, notice the first thing that Messiah said. He says, now, now listen Nicodemus, I know you didn't catch it, but I want you to catch this part, because this part you understand. <clears throat> Let's go to verse 5. This is where Messiah begins to explain to Nicodemus. He says, listen, truly, truly, Nicodemus, listen to this. Unless a person is born of the water, so I just want to stop right there. What does born of the water mean? So now, 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 uh, Yahshua is speaking to Nicodemus uh, with language that Nicodemus should understand. The phrase born of the water does not refer to natural birth. Now, you know, when <laughs> many years ago when I came into the things of Elohim and listening to um, various interpretations on this particular verse, in particular from the uh, Baptist dispensational perspective and also from the uh, Pentecostal perspective, because, you know, most Pentecostal churches, they, they get their theology from, from a mix of Baptist and uh, Wesleyan uh, theology. That's where they get it from, just kind of put it together. But what they taught on this was that the phrase being born of the water refers to natural birth, because what they're, they're doing is showing the contrast as to why Messiah said that and being born of the Spirit. Well, it's a given that everybody born that's alive, all right, is born of natural birth. That's a given. Messiah was not referring to natural birth when he said being born of the water. We, come on, let's, let's look at the text. Because notice what Yahshua said. Yahshua is giving, he is giving requirements about entering into the kingdom. Everybody that's born naturally is born naturally. Being born naturally is not a requirement to enter the kingdom. What Messiah says, unless or except you are born of the water and the spirit. Now notice, what does born of the water mean? So when we look at that phrase, born of the water refers to water immersion. Water baptism, that's what that refers to. Being born of water, you have to be submerged in the water, and then when you come out of the water, you're being brought forth out of the water. So I want to talk a few minutes about that piece, born of the water. Being born of the water.
water was a phrase that Nicodemus could relate to and that he understood. Because Nicodemus understood that when a pagan from the nations, and you had many pagans that were Greeks and Romans of the first century that converted to the faith of Israel. In other words, they became Judeans. And in the process of conversion to become a full-fledged Israelite, they had to do three things. They had to offer a sacrifice. That was one of them. If you were a male, you had to be circumcised. That was another one. But then the last one was water immersion. The water immersion signified that a person was being dipped into the living waters. The living waters, that's running waters, you know, it was preferred that when a person be immersed in waters, that the waters be running waters or moving waters because it represents living waters. It gives this, the, the idea that the waters represent Elohim, Yahuwah. It represents the name of Yahuwah. Because when a person was immersed into the waters and then came out of the waters, it signified that the old life of paganism had been buried. But in the coming out of the waters, the person was now born into a new life. They were born anew. So the concept of being born a second time with reference to a person's faith, spiritually speaking, was something that Nicodemus understood. But he understood that only as it related to proselytes, people who were being converted. He didn't understand that with respect to himself. I want you to catch this. So Nicodemus is listening to Messiah. Messiah is presenting to him the concept that you have to be born from above in a spiritual sense, Nicodemus. Not going back into your mother's womb. We know that all men that come into the world are regarded as being Elohim, as the sons of Elohim in the technical sense. All men are regarded as sons of Elohim in the technical sense because all of us in the technical sense, we come from Elohim by virtue of creation. That's how Nicodemus was seeing it. But Yahshua was saying, I'm trying to get you to understand this specifically with reference to the spiritual part. And so he says, unless a person is born of the water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. So, then as he continued to explain to Nicodemus, because he tells Nicodemus, look, that that's born of the flesh, that's flesh. I ain't talking about flesh. I ain't talking about your physical. He said, but that which is born or brought forth of the spirit is spirit. He said, I'm talking about something spiritual. That's the happening. And he says to him, don't get twisted up in your mind. Don't get confused about what I'm saying. He says, marvel not that I say to you that you must be born from above. He said, listen, this is a spiritual thing I'm talking about, Nicodemus. So he continues to move forward. And he says, now, the wind blows. You can understand this. He's trying to help Nicodemus understand. He said, Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it wants to blow. All right? And you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from. You can understand that, right? You know? He says, so it is. With the spirit. <laughs> so it is, he says, notice, 
being born of the Spirit. Now, in the latter part of that eighth verse, Messiah is making it very specific now that what I'm talking about, Nicodemus, is being born or brought forth of the Spirit. So Nicodemus, <laughs> he asks, how can these things be? Now, like I said, Nicodemus, his mind was stuck. His mind was stuck in connecting the natural processes of a human being coming into the world as being related to being born from above. He, he's still connecting it that way. He wasn't yet able to connect that Yahshua was talking about a spiritual birthing and being brought forth. And so when he says, how can these things be? Then Messiah says, hold up, Nicodemus, look. You are a master teacher. You are a more in Israel. Oh, Nicodemus being a ruler of the Judeans, being a master teacher, Nicodemus should have known what Messiah was talking about when Messiah was conveying this message about how what he was referring to with reference to being born from above had to do with a spiritual birthing. Now what I want to do, I want to go over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 verse 11. Because here in this verse, John the Baptist shares some information that helps us to understand that Hebraic concept about baptism and how that Hebraic concept about baptism, it is connected with being born of the water. And so as we go to the third, the third chapter of Matthew, we want to get to the third chapter, 11 verse. Because there's a couple things that John says in here. One of them that has to do with clarifying how baptism is understood Hebraically, but also with reference to being born of the Spirit except John the Baptist uses different language. So let's go to that 11th verse. Notice, what John says in the 11th verse is, I indeed baptize you in water unto repentance, or unto teshuva. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear or to carry, he shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now I want to talk about the first thing that John said with reference to baptism. Hebraically, when we talk about baptism, in the mindset of the ancients, Baptism meant something that was much more important than how baptism is understood within the framework of this modern Christian uh, society and culture. And many today within the framework of the Christian churches, the Western Christian church, they kind of look at baptism as, as though it doesn't really mean much. Almost as if it, since it's just a, a outward expression of an inward working. But in the ancient time, baptism was something that was connected to a person dying to an old life and being born anew to a new life. It was associated with this idea of a person being attached to the name of the Almighty. Let me take it a little deeper. If I can use this analogy. 
When a woman gets married to a man, what happens is that she loses her name and she is now taking on the name of the husband that she is married to. Back in the ancient time, when proselytes, people who were converting to the faith of Israel, would become a full-fledged Israelite, there were three things they did. One of them was that they offered a sacrifice. If you were a male, you got circumcised. And then the last thing was water immersion or water baptism. Now that water baptism signified that a person was dying to the old pagan life and they were being born anew into a new life with Elohim. That baptism symbolized that they were being placed or put into the person of Yahuwah. They were being attached to his name and they were taking on his name. All of those things were represented in the baptism. Now when John talks about baptizing, notice what he says. He says, I baptize you in water unto repentance. Now, notice what John is saying. He's saying that this baptism is bringing you into repentance. Now, the Hebrew term, which is the more accurate term to understand repentance by, is the term that John was using, because John was speaking Hebrew. But a lot of times when we see the word repentance, we think from the Greek meaning of repent, that it's a change of mind. That's not what repentance means. From the Hebrew definition, the Hebrew definition from the word teshuva, it means to return. It means a returning to the creator. It has to do with the whole idea of a person who has not only changed their mind. It, it, it has to do with more than just changing their mind. It has to do with changing their whole direction, their whole lifestyle. It is a cognitive decision of turning one's back on pagan, pagan living, turning one's back on everything that is in contradiction to the Creator, and uniting with the Creator. So when a person was baptized, that baptism was a part of their performing repentance. It was a part of the process of teshuva, returning to the Almighty. So it meant a whole lot more than just an outward sign of an inward grace. No, no. <laughs> Hebraically, it meant a whole lot more. It was a necessary part because it was one's demonstration of repentance. So it's important that we understand what the phrase born of the water meant. When you look at uh, John chapter 3 verses 1 through 10 when Messiah talked about saying to Nicodemus, unless you're born of the water and of the spirit. He was saying that you go through this process of being converted. You go through water immersion. And see, when John talked about it, John talked about it with reference to those he was baptizing because during that time, Israelites were being called to baptism by John because the new or renewed covenant was being introduced. But see, prior to John coming and preaching and baptizing, no Israelites were being baptized. And see, Nicodemus, he couldn't connect with what Yahshua was saying when Yahshua told him that he needed 
to be born of the water and of the spirit. Nicodemus couldn't connect with it because he didn't see himself as being separated from Elohim. Nicodemus didn't see himself as needing to perform repentance. Y'all catching this? That's important. But Yahshua was saying, brother, you got to go through the same process. Because you see, if Yahshua went through the process of being baptized, he became our example that we should follow his steps, who did not need to go through the process of being baptized, but he performed it anyway. Everyone else must also go through the process of being born of the water to enter into the kingdom. It's important that we catch that. So now in John making this statement, he clarified the purpose of baptism and what it meant he bravely. See, in order to be born of the water, you got to be immersed into the water and then you come out of it. That's a being born, being brought out, being brought forth. That was how they understood it he bravely. Being born of the water is being immersed in the water. You know, if you were to go and to read Hebraic material that had to do with proselytism, of people who were pagans coming into the faith of Israel, you'll come across this concept of being born anew by going through the waters of immersion. But something that John stated with reference to the one who was coming that was mightier than him has to do with Messiah. He said that he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now in the King James Version it says baptize you with, but in the literal Greek, the Greek has the word in which is the epsilon nu. Those two letters you, you'll say in in Greek, but also it is the same word for in in English. So it's, it's more appropriate to not use the word baptize with the Holy Spirit, but baptize in. That's literally what John was saying. That he that's coming after me, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, it's interesting that John stated that there would be two immersions in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, when you go back over into John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, Messiah said, you're going to be born of the water. You must be born of the water and born of the Spirit. Now, being born of the Spirit or being put into the Holy Spirit and being brought forth, from the Spirit, I equate that to being baptized in the Spirit. Now, I know those who are listening to me right now are probably thinking, no, brother, we don't accept that, and that's okay. You know, I mean, there, there are many who are from Baptists and Pentecostal and other perspectives who, who have these views about what the baptism in the Holy Spirit means. And... I'm not in any way discounting the move of the Holy Spirit or speaking in tongues or any of that because I have received the baptism by fire. I speak in other tongues. And, and if you were to uh, contact us and call on our prayer line when we're praying in here, you will hear me speaking in other tongues. <laughs> so uh, that's not, a, not something that I disagree with. But in... In trying to understand the scriptures, Hebraically, I want us to remember that. In understanding the concepts Hebraically, what you find is that when John says that he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, that that phrase is also associated with being born of the Spirit. Just like, now I know this is hard for many people to take. I, I know, I know it's hard, but please, please, try, 
Try to open your mind just for a moment and think Hebraically like they understood it and thought it then. The phrase born of the water, Hebraically, is associated with being immersed or baptized in water. So in their thinking, it's the same idea. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit is associated with being born of the Spirit. It's just the same idea. Because in order to be birthed out of something, you got to be immersed into it in order to be brought forth from it. So what does Elohim do when we are born from above? He takes us, because now this is a spiritual birthing, spiritual bringing forth. The spirit, the spirit births you out. <laughs> That's what it means. But you got to be submerged fully into the spirit in order to be birthed by the spirit. And that's what Elohim does. When we perform teshuva, he puts us through the process of our spirit going through a birthing. We are dipped in the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and born of the Spirit. But that's something different from being baptized in fire. I know there are many who have a whole lot of different views on the baptism of fire. But I want to make this connection because when we look at fire, fire is symbolic of the power. It is symbolic of that element of Elohim that consumes. And when we look at what was done on Shavuot, commonly called Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it says that there were cloven tongues of fire that set up on their heads. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But notice, what was seen was the fire, the flame. So when they were filled, empowered, with the Spirit, that was the baptism of fire. You see, Messiah, he told the apostles before he ascended, he said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you be endued with power, the dunamis, the dynamite, the fire. I want us to catch that. He said, you're going to be endued with fire. The power, dunamis. Anytime we think about dynamite, what does it do? It blows up stuff. You see fire. See, this is what Messiah was talking about. When they received the infilling of the Holy Spirit, that was the baptism of fire. So when we get saved, as we call it, born of the Spirit, as we call it, and I know this is hard, maybe, for some to accept. But we are immersed into the Holy Spirit. When we are born of the Spirit, we're immersed in the Holy Spirit, born of the Spirit. And we have everything that we need that pertains to life and everything that is concerning the divine nature in Elohim. We have all of that in the Messiah. When we're born of the Spirit. Hebraically, that is being immersed into the Spirit. But that's a second, or that's a different thing, let me say that, from the baptism of fire. Baptism of fire has to do with the Holy Spirit working and bringing his power in our life. That's what the baptism of fire is. And John, what he said, he said it right. He said, he that's coming after me, he said, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, 
Now, there are many who have not yet been baptized in the fire yet. It doesn't mean that you're a second class believer because you have not experienced the baptism of fire yet. It doesn't mean that. In the Messiah, you have all things that pertain to life and things that pertain to the divine nature of Elohim. You have all that you need in the Messiah because when, when we came into the Messiah, we were completely immersed into the Messiah. There's nothing that we lack in the Messiah. In us, we have the Ruach HaKodesh. But as we grow in the Ruach HaKodesh, there are things that happen in our life and in our growth where we have the manifestations of the Spirit that take place. And it is ignited by this immersion in His fire. It happens in our lives. Now some will say, no, they don't want to have it unless they speak in tongues. Not everybody speaks in tongues. Some people prophesy. Some people have other manifestations that show up in their life. I'm just saying. Not everybody's going to speak in tongues when they have the baptism of fire of the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm sharing this because it is important that we as believers begin to see the scriptures more from a Hebraic context instead of from a Western Christian theological perspective because so oftentimes when we don't see things from the Hebraic perspective and context and relate it to how they understood it and brought it forward, we begin to create division and dissension among ourselves and we separate ourselves from each other instead of just accepting the word embracing one another and not trying to make comparisons. See, one of the, one of the things that's, that's a uh, telltale sign that a person is full of the Holy Spirit it's not the manifestations. It's when you see a person that's walking in obedience to the commandments and have the fruit of the Spirit flowing out of their life. Because when you have those ingredients operating, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit can't help but flow. They can't help but flow. It's automatic. I mean, you got some people who may have an experience and may legitimately manifest the speaking in tongues, but then a couple months down the road, their lifestyle does not emulate one that is in connection with Elohim. That's important. If you are not keeping the commandments and you don't have the power, the enabling power of the Holy Spirit to give you that ability to live obediently, then you need to check. Because oftentimes there are people who come to Messiah, but they don't come the right way. What do I mean by that? See, in order to really experience what we call being born from above, a person must perform repentance, teshuva. And in performing teshuva, that individual has made a conscious decision to reject the pagan lifestyle, to reject all ways of evil, to reject what displeases the Almighty. See, and a lot of times, those who come or choose to come to the Most High do not make a conscious decision to reject sin and everything attached to it. But that's what repentance really is. When you return to Elohim 
You have turned your back upon everything that is in contradiction to the Most High. If you're coming to the Almighty and you say, oh, forgive me of my sins, but yet in the back of your mind, you still have plans to live a lifestyle that is against the scriptures, you haven't repented. All you did is ask the Most High to forgive you, and you've made a confession that you believe that Yahshua is the Messiah, but you have not repented. And I hate to break the news too many, but there are many people who are not born from above. You say, well, I believe in Jesus. So, demons believe in Jesus. True repentance means that you make up in your mind that you are going to connect with Elohim. That's what Teshuvah is all about. It's returning back to the Creator. It's coming underneath His authority. It's submitting to the rules and governance of His house. See, we don't hear preaching like that. Hardly at all in this era. But that's what it is. That's why Yahshua said, if a person follows after me, he said, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. Yahshua made it very plain. You got to give up what you want and do what Elohim wants. That's what it means. Yahshua said, if you don't repent, you will likewise perish. So when we talk about this being born from above, born of the Spirit, I like to equate that to being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I know some probably disagree with that, and that's okay. That's, that's okay if you don't see it that way. But I refer to the baptism of fire as the endowment of power for service. That's what Yahshua gives to his people to serve him. To be able to have that enablement. To live obediently. To perform service unto him. When we begin to understand, I believe, the things of the Most High a bit more accurately, or shall I say Hebraically, it will help us to become more unified, I believe, as the people of Elohim. But for those who may not have really made the decision or honestly repented, I challenge you to give yourself in complete repentance to the Creator. For those who may be watching us by live stream, I want to say to you, if you have not truly repented and performed Teshuvah, you need to do that today. When you do that, then you will truly experience what it means to be born from above or to be born of the Spirit. Because the Almighty wants you to not have a false sense of security. There are many that have a false sense of security. Because when preachers preach, they preach the message in a way so that they could hurry and get someone to make a confession. But you can't hurry someone to make a confession. The Holy Spirit has to bring conviction upon the life of a person in order for them to, to make a confession to truly return back to the Almighty. The Almighty has not called us servants to be in the business of trying to get people to make confessions. He's called us to preach the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and that when the Holy Spirit convicts a person's life to bring them to repentance, then and only then are they born again. And they come into the kingdom. And what we're trying to do 
is give you the truth so that the Holy Spirit can touch your life and truly birth you into the kingdom of Elohim. Let us pray. Abba Yah, thank you for this opportunity to be able to teach, to share, and to communicate this message today. I trust, Abba Yah, that as the message has been a challenge, that it has been received in love. It's my desire that when we teach, that we teach and speak, that we do it in love, speaking the truth in love. But Father, it's our desire that men and women truly know you according to the truth of your word. May the word fall upon good ground and may it perform the work in the lives of the hearers that receive it, bringing salvation and deliverance to those that truly repent. We ask this in Yahshua's name. Amen. Well, we bless the Almighty for each and every one of you who have heard this teaching and trust that it has encouraged and strengthened you. For those who are watching us, we, we trust that the word has ministered to you and that it has been effective. If you want to know more about uh, our ministry, uh, Voice of Messiah Ministries, this, this is the uh, media outreach of Messiah Tabernacle Fellowship, which is under the auspice of New Covenant Messianic Ministries. But we'd like to invite you to visit our website at www.ncmmi.20m.com. There's a great deal of information that uh, is available to you. Uh, please uh, check out the Written Word Library link, where it has a number of written articles on a variety of subjects and uh, also there's free biblical studies that are available and uh, tools, biblical tools that are available to help you in your development in Messiah along with a number of books, uh, PDF books, ancient uh, historical uh, books and information that will help you to uh, be informed in your faith and also uh, information that's related to support information regarding your faith. Uh, we provide that because it is our desire to help and make disciples of the nations. And if you find that this uh, teaching and this ministry has been a blessing to you, please share with us a donation. It helps us in our work that we do to bring the message to the nations and to be a blessing to those in need and the poor in our community. You can uh, donate on our website. Again, the website is www.ncmmi.20m.com and we surely would appreciate you sharing with us to be a support. Well, the Most High be praised. Trust that this has been a blessing to you. We invite you to tune in with us when we meet on Shabbat, which is this Saturday at 1230, and uh, be a part of that gathering if you have opportunity to do so. Well, the Most High be praised, and we say to each and every one of you, Shalom.